Thanks for listening to Creative Control. Uh, While I have you here, please consider supporting Youth Empowerment and Support Services, otherwise known as YES. Based in Edmonton, Alberta, YES provides immediate and low-barrier overnight and day shelter, temporary supportive housing, and individualized wraparound supports for young people aged 15 to 24. They work collaboratively within a network of care focused on the prevention of youth homelessness by providing youth with the necessary supports to stabilize their housing, improve their well-being, build life skills, connect with community, and avoid re-entry into homelessness. Learn more about how to donate or otherwise support YES by visiting YESS.org. Hi, this is Mark Lee Morrison from the podcast Low Profile. I live in Olympia, Washington with my wife and two daughters, and I support Vishkana's creative control on Patreon because I appreciate his journalistic integrity. Vish talks with a lot of artists I care about, and he never asks any boring questions. I love hearing his interviews, and as a Patreon supporter, I get to hear even more of them. If you enjoy creative control too, I implore you to join me as a sustaining contributor. To make your flexible monthly donation to Creative Control, please visit patreon.com slash creative control today. Creative Control with Vish Khanna. Michael Azarad is an esteemed music journalist, editor, public speaker, and author based in New York City. Over the course of his career, Azarad has written for Rolling Stone, The New Yorker, and The New York Times, among other outlets, and two of his acclaimed books, Come As You Are, The Story of Nirvana, and later, Our Band Could Be Your Life, Scenes from the American Underground, 1981 to 1991, are essential for any music fan interested in deep dives and insightful context about how some of the greatest bands and artists of the past 50 years came into existence. During the COVID-19 pandemic, Azarad revisited his book about Nirvana and began annotating it, providing some more background about sections of his original story, while also updating them with fresh research, further explanations and discoveries, and even telling a few new stories about his friendship and interaction with Kurt Cobain, Chris Novoselic, and Dave Grohl, which he's never shared publicly before. The result is a powerful book called The Amplified Come As You Are, The Story of Nirvana, which was released by Harper One on September 24th, 2023, and prompted Michael and I to reconnect for a a talk about things like uh, Nirvana, journalism, and friendship, telling the truth and rock mythology, self-consciousness and indifference about perception, being a rock star who everyone can relate to, reflecting upon Kurt Cobain's clinical conditions, shame, collage, and other recurring motifs in Cobain's life and works, jamming with Nirvana, citing certain podcasts, a possible prequel, other future plans, and much more. A part of the Entertainment One Network with the support of listeners like you who follow and subscribe to this donor-driven podcast and spread the word about it and make flexible monthly donations at patreon.com slash creative control. That Patreon is the primary source of revenue for all the work I put into this particular show and uh, it sustains me and even my family a little bit. It's not a lot, but uh, that's the goal. So if you have the means and the uh, inclination to support me and my work, that Patreon is the best place to do it. So please click on the link in the show notes. Otherwise, again, patreon.com slash creative control. Thank you so much for your support. Plus, in-kind support from the likes of uh, Pizza Trocadero, The Bookshelf, and Planet Bean Coffee in Guelph, Ontario, and Granddad's Donuts in Hamilton, Ontario. This is episode 812 of Creative Control, featuring the lovely and talented Michael Azarad with your host, me, Vish Khanna. Hi, Michael. How's it going? It's going well, Fish. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's lovely to have you back. I, 
I missed you, frankly. It's been so long since oh. uh, we've spoken that I, I the last time you were on, we were talking about a different book. Oh, yeah. We talked. I, for, I've totally blanked on this until recently. Remember your book about uh, rock critic law? Is yeah. that what it was? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, 101 Ways to Write as Badly as Possible or something yes. like that. Yes. Yeah. That uh, life-changing book for me as a, as a <laughs> music writer. Thank you. I was like, oh, I've done at least three of those things. I feel badly. Uh, so thank you. Uh, no, it was very, very great. It was helpful. Uh uh, first, I've done a few of them myself. Well, I think that's how you learn that they might be hack or cliche. You do them yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, where in the world are you today, Michael? I am at my home in uh, sunny New York City. Oh, lovely. You've been in New York uh, as long as uh, I've known you. I was thinking about, uh, I was telling my wife the first time we encountered each other, oddly, Oslo, Norway. Yes. You Do you remember this? <laughs> I do. <laughs> yeah, we were at the Bilarm Festival, and it was very, uh, I don't know, I'd never been there before. I forget, had you been there before? No, no, I'd never been to, you know, that festival or Norway or anything. And uh, wow, what a cool country. Everybody's so smart. <laughs> yeah, they seem they seemed smart. I remember it being expensive and dark. Yes. And uh, that's all I really remember. And uh, But I met you and some other really nice people, and uh, no, it was great. So uh, yeah, no, it's nice to reconnect. Uh, congratulations on this uh, this book, the Amplified Come As You Are: The Story of Nirvana. Let's get right into it. I know you've explained this in the in the prologue, but uh, what prompted this iteration uh, and this actual treatment of this book? Can you speak to that? Well, you know, there's some quote from I don't know, maybe Umberto Eco or someone you know smart like that, where he says something like. You know, everything you write, there's always something uh, that you later regret or wish you could change. And I really felt like that with, um, you know, with uh, Come As You Are, the story of Nirvana. I wrote that book, you know, while the band still existed and, you know, things were, it's a very, it was a very dynamic and fluid situation. Mm. And I was much younger and much more inexperienced. And um, I don't know, there were a lot of things I would have said or done differently. A lot of things in the book that I think now need some context explained and things like that. And uh, I just had always wanted to say uh, a thing or two about just a couple of spots in the book. And then uh, the pandemic started <laughs> and there was nothing going on. And I thought, well, you know, now is the time to do things you've always wanted to do, but never had the time for and that was one of them. So I just wrote down this one little piece. I think it was about the um, Kurt sleeping under the bridge and whether, you know, how, whether that was, that actually happened or not. Yeah. And, uh, and that, you know, I wrote that out and I thought, oh, I'll, I'll just put that in a blog post and, you know, I'll tweet out the link and, you know, maybe who, whoever is really interested, in, you know, in some deep Nirvana science, uh, you know, we'll, we'll look at the post. But then I, I wrote that out and it was very satisfying. And then I decided, oh, let's see if there's anything else I have to say. So I went to page one of Come As You Are and I, I saw some stuff out that, oh, uh, gosh, I got a comment on that too. So I wrote that and that was very satisfying. Mm. I turned to page two. Oh, yep. There's something I got to say there too. And um, I just kept going. <laughs> and about two years later, I'd gone through the entire book. That's, and that's how it happened. You know, while everybody else was uh, perfecting their sourdough recipe or learning Italian, I was uh, <laughs> deeply annotating my 1993 biography of Nirvana. This is a defining work for you. Uh, and anytime uh, anyone engages in a, in, a, in a work like this where it was fulfilling at the time and impactful, you can't help but have regrets. I mean, I think we're seeing this in this day and age. If you um, sort of bypass the cynicism of all these reissues of albums and the remixes and the remasters and the tweaking of things, I think mm. what you're getting at is a similar sort of spirit of what if I could fix a frozen thing? What if I could redo some things like dealing with that regret? Do you see a correlation between what you've done with this book and kind of remixing a record in a way? Oh, that, that's an yeah, interesting uh, comparison. Um, you know, that, that uh, ties into um, what our uh, distinguished and brilliant colleague, uh, Simon Reynolds, would call retromania. Hmm. And he wrote a whole book about that, about how uh, so much of 
uh, music culture is, you know, backwards looking. And why is that? And, you know, I, I may have overstressed the regret part. You know, there was just a lot of stuff that I thought cried out uh, for further commentary because I'd gained some insights, you know, into the, the story uh, in the intervening 30 years. I'd just become a little wiser, maybe a better writer. But also there's so much stuff in the book that cries out for context, especially because, you know, the book was published 30 years ago and most of the people who read it now <laughs> were not born when the book came out. Yeah. And there's a lot of stuff that needs explaining. So I, you know, explain stuff like, well, what did it mean to sell out? What did it mean to uh, sign to a major label? <laughs> right. <laughs> what was what was what was heroin chic? Uh -huh. um, yeah. You know, uh, uh, wh why is it interesting that Kurt and Courtney were, were watching a Leaf Garrett movie? <laughs> There's all kinds of stuff. You know, Republican moral panics, latchkey kids, you know, slackers. All kinds of stuff that I think benefits explaining. Uh, you know, for a modern audience, but also I think sheds a lot of light on why Nirvana exploded in the first place. So it, it, it wasn't just, uh, you know, me going back and, and fixing things. That, that's actually not too much of that. And most of it is just amplification, as the, as the title says. I'm, I'm, you know, amplifying, I'm expanding on little kernels of interesting things in the book and making yeah. them sometimes into full-fledged essays. Yeah. And by the way, I don't think a remix of a record is necessarily fixing things. It's heightening. Mm. It's heightening things, you know. Take, mm. the, for example, the 2013 remix of In Utero that, uh, as memory serves, Steve Albini actually was engaged in in conducting that remix. And he just, the song was there. The structure was there. But it's a matter of pulling up faders and and mm. and, you know, heightening guitar parts that were there, that were buried. And they're up now. I'm not saying that's what you've done. It's not a real solid uh, corollary. But at the same time, these annotations are unbelievable to me. The way you can take the 2023, or I assume you started writing this in the last three years, whatever, take a, a modern perspective on what was going on in the early to mid-90s. And like you say, how quaint it might seem to a, a young person about what is selling out. Well, you know, yeah. if a band uh, gave their song to a commercial, what do you mean? Every band does that. You know, it's normal now. You know, I mean, yesterday uh, I was driving my son home. He's 12. He was driving him home from uh, his basketball practice thing. And we were listening to Nirvana. And uh, obviously I've been, uh, well, maybe not obvious. Uh, I know you mentioned in the book that you've had trouble listening to the band um, mm. since ostensibly... Uh, since Kurt Cobain died. Um, yeah. And I have artists like that who I got close to and I can't listen to cer definitely certain records. I just can't do it. I still haven't. There's certain, David Berman, for example. I can't listen to the Purple Mountains record. I can listen mm -hmm. to his previous band. Anyway, I don't mean to go on a tangent. I'm just saying we were listening to Nirvana and my son mm -hmm. has knows about Nirvana and he knows about, he's really into hip hop and he knows about artists and he knows that some of them die young. And he knows it. He he he's twelve. We don't talk about it. I said, "Do you know much about Kurt Cobain?" He said, "Yeah." I'm like, "You know he died." Yes. Do you know how he died? Yes, he killed himself. And you know this is shocking for me to hear my son know this. I will confess to you. Mm. It, I'm not. Mm. I try not to shield or hide uh, the hard truths about life, uh, you know, from my children. But it was interesting to me that he knew that, and he said it sort of matter-of-factly, and then I realized that as he's delving into hip-hop, there is a generation right now that hears about a young artist dying of a drug overdose by their own hand, I don't know, I would say every couple of months, maybe. Would you say it's been more commonplace, maybe, since Kurt died, and that maybe, maybe the young generation was like, yeah, He's an icon for that as much as his music on some level, like, sadly. Does, mm. does that make sense? Gosh, I, I, I hope not. Um, yeah. I, you know, I, I like to think that, that, you know, the music is the, you know, is the thing that, that lasts. Um, uh, I don't know. I, I could tell you why, why that is the case. But, yeah, um, you know, pop star uh, deaths, um, I mean, to a certain extent, they were, they've been with us a long time and they've 
been somewhat frequent. Yeah. I don't know if they're more frequent than, you know, the general populace. But yeah, uh, I, I, yeah. It's, it I don't, just I don't seems, know what to say about uh, that. It seems more frequent and I... I don't know if they're immune to it per se. I wish my son were here, but he's at school because he's a good kid. Uh, <laughs> but um, it was just interesting because I, you have to understand, like Nirvana emerged when I was about 13 years old and profound impact on me, opened up a whole world to me. And Kurt is someone I identified with and continue to identify with. However, in reading more about who he actually was on some level, I'm, a different portrait of him has emerged. You had the very mm -hmm. unique distinction of not only covering him, but then befriending him. And then I think becoming, sorry, in the podcast realm, the, there's often jokes about how hosts think they're therapists or whatever. <laughs> but I get, the I get the sense from the dynamic you shared with Kurt that you each were sounding boards at least for one another. Maybe not on a psychological level, but you would talk about your your respective problems with one another. Is that is that fair? Yes, but uh, I think it was much more uh, from his direction than mine. Um, <laughs> right. You mentioned that yeah. one of the anecdotes, he called you in a panic and then was going on and on about various things when he finally realized what he was doing. It was like, uh, and how are you, right? That was, <laughs> yeah. that was the yeah. dynamic. Okay. I, yeah, yeah. He, I don't think he, he never called me to ask me how I'm doing. He, it was always something, some uproar or something that he just needed to vent about. But he trusted you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I want to, yeah. if it's okay with you, I'd like to read a, a passage from the prologue that really stuck out for me and I think really captures um, what's going on in this version of this book, the amplified mm -hmm. version. Is it okay if I, if I read something for folks here? Oh, please do. Okay, here it is. I'll do my best to recite this as accurately as I can. In journalist Janet Malcolm's essential book, The Journalist and the Murderer, published in 1990, she notes that every journalist, quote, is a kind of confidence man preying on people's vanity, ignorance, or loneliness, gaining their trust, and betraying them without remorse, end quote. But the subject can also play the journalist exactly the same way. Kurt, being a student of rock history, knew that the story of a rock band is essentially a legend in the sense that there's some wiggle room in the truth as long as it serves the overall myth. So Kurt was an unreliable narrator of his own story. And that's nothing new. Everyone does it. It's on the journalist to determine what's true and what isn't. But sometimes the journalist just plays along because they're naive, lazy, overworked, or they just want to be in on the game because it makes for sensational copy, or maybe they want to ingratiate themselves with the subject so they can work with them again, whichever way it works to the artist's advantage, which is to say that I wish I could have brought more skepticism to the project and done more reporting, but there just wasn't time. I had to finish the manuscript quickly so it could be published around the release of In Utero. I went a bit long there, and I apologize, Michael, but this really stuck out for me. The regret you have, I think, is mixed with some level of, I don't want to say bitterness, but I gather from your annotations that you feel on some occasions that beyond self-preservation, self-mythology, there was actually dishonesty emanating from Kurt. Is that a fair way of looking at it? Um. Uh, I don't know. I guess, I don't know, dishonesty. <laughs> that's, a, that's a little bit of a tough word. I got the sense that all Kurt really wanted out of this book was uh, due to something that had happened, uh, I guess, earlier that year, which was that um, Vanity Fair had published an antagonistic uh, piece about Courtney and her drug use and perhaps uh, Kurt's drug use mm -hmm. that was used apparently in part to temporarily relieve them of custody of their newborn baby. Yeah. And they, you know, quite understandably did not want uh, that to happen again. So the real, you know, crux of why they were doing this book was to make sure that they were portrayed as um, good parents and that they were not using drugs any longer. Yeah. So the drug stuff was 
largely shielded from me. Yeah. I, I don't think I ever saw them high. They never talked about doing drugs. So people have the benefit of, um, you know, 30 years of hindsight, but I, I was right. I was right in the thick of it. And uh, when you're in the thick of it, sometimes you're not able to see things that in retrospect are obvious. And um, so, you know, everybody's read the articles and the books and they know that Kurt was using drugs at the time, but I didn't have any articles or books mm. to know that Kurt was using drugs. All I had was his word and what I observed yeah. because I was in the current moment. And uh, again, you know, people can, you know, criticize that book with all the hindsight in the world, but it was written contemporaneously and there was no other source for me to go to. Like I was, you know, that's original source stuff. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I think everything else about Come As You Are was kind of, um, you know, bread for the, you know, the, the middle of that sandwich. Mm. And it, it so happens that the bread itself, you know, the story around it is super tasty. <laughs> it's, a, you know, there's, it, there's a great, Nirvana had a great story, especially I, I'm particularly uh, enamored of, uh, you know, how they began. Yeah. Yeah. And the whole point of it was to show, you know, that they were just like you and me <laughs> in that that was the whole idea of indie rock, you know, kill rock stars. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. There are no one's a star. It's it's an egalitarian world. And I I really still believe that. I think it's great when artists aren't canonized. And, you know, you were talking about kind of the mythology around Kurt. And that was a lar large part of the book then. And with this new version is to demythologize Kurt and show that he was a, a real person <laughs> um, and that real people can make great things. I, I will say that I got the real person thing uh, after first reading this book when it came out. I didn't think he was a perfect person. Um, mm. He clearly was flawed and would acknowledge some of those flaws. When I get at the dishonesty part, and I appreciate that that might be a hard word as a catch-all, but even mm. how this book is framed is that Courtney Love called you up and asked you if you would be interested in writing a book about the story of Nirvana. You get on the phone with Kurt. You, I believe you say, um, hmm, interesting. Can I talk to Kurt about this? Kurt gets yeah. on the phone with you and basically uh, says, yeah, I want you to just tell the truth. I I, yep. I don't want I don't, it's not an it's not an authorized biography, but obviously they helped. I assume they helped you get access to people. The band all participated, but by the end of the book, this book, um, you because you can you you can go back to the context and things that happened after the book was published. You come upon Kurt being asked about the book and saying, you know, someone's like, "Why? Where did this book come from?" You know, and Kurt responds, "Well, this guy wanted to write this book." Yeah, there's a there's several instances in the annotations, I think, where this sort of thing happens. Here's what I wrote at the time, and uh, you know, you, with the original text of the book, and here's what Kurt said about it at the time. Many of the annotations, I would argue, seem to be like this isn't actually true. We have since learned, mm -hmm. or I have since learned, this mm -hmm. is not true. Now. Mm -hmm. I bring this up because you are, like I said earlier, you have your uh, your relationship with someone like Kurt Cobain and Kurt in particular is a, a strange knot that some of us in this field end up in, where you end up being asked to or of your own volition wanting to cover someone, interview them, and because the conversation gets so intimate, and if it goes well, it's friendly, you become friends. And that can cloud your judgment sometimes about how to be objective. Like, in the end, do you feel like you were Kurt's friend or were you a journalist and a music writer? Because that I pick up on that vibe in the annotations. Who was I to this guy exactly? Do you know who you were? Well, I think, uh, yeah, yeah, well, I think I note in the annotations that the you know, whatever friendship we had was, um, you know, started after the book was completed. During the time uh, we were doing the interviews, yeah, it, you know, you don't spend, you know, 24 hours with someone 
you know, usually in the wee hours of the morning talking about their entire life mm -hmm. without having some sort of bond. But I, I, I wouldn't say I was, you know, in any way his friend at that point. I was his biographer. But back to that, uh, that word authorized, by the way, that's a very specific publishing term. Yes, yes. And it doesn't mean that the band is allowing you or the subject is allowing you to write something. It means that basically they have final cut. And so Come As You Are was not authorized. It was an unauthorized biography. The band cooperated, but they had no control over the manuscript. There's a there's a scene in the in this book where you outline how you flew the manuscript. You and the manuscript flew to uh, what was it? A hotel? I don't know exactly. Where Where were you when, yeah. when Kurt read the manuscript? A uh, hotel in Seattle. Yeah, in Seattle. So you you mm -hmm. you actually take the manuscript and watch him. It's like a spy movie. You watch yeah. him read it. Yeah. And and what's that interact? <laughs> what was that actually? I know. Sorry, just for uh, those who haven't read the book yet, I I know what it was like. Take mm -hmm. us take us there. Take us to that moment where you're with Kurt in a hotel room and he has to read a very lengthy book. Uh, in front of you, what was that experience yeah. like? And had you ever done yeah. that before, by the way? No, this was your first uh, book. Of course, you hadn't done this before. Had you ever yeah. had someone, uh, an interview subject, actually vet? A, sorry, I want to use the right word here. I appreciate that it's not authorized. I appreciate that mm -hmm. you had final say and the publishers had mm -hmm. final say. Mm -hmm. But that is unusual on some level to, to send the subject of a piece, the entire final draft for ostensibly fact checking that's why you went there right for those kinds of things um no um oh i didn't i didn't go uh to get kurt's fact check of the manuscript that was not <laughs> uh the purpose my agent and i think maybe my pu publisher i'm not sure but certainly my agent felt that there were so many you know what, what they perceived as bombshells in the book hmm. that we should let um Kurt read it so he could be prepared for, you know, press questions and he wouldn't, you know, be blindsided by oh. all kinds of questions about the book. Yeah. And so it was, it was, you know, we let him read it as, as a courtesy. And as he was reading it, he did point out a very few factual errors. Mm -hmm. I think uh, I, like one, I remember, the only one I really remember was that um, I got the name of his uh, aunt who gave him his first guitar or something like that. Uh, yeah wrong yeah um it was aunt mary and not something else so you know with stuff like that honestly he had like three or four minor factual corrections and then sometimes he would say like oh why do you have to put that in and i i remember one of them was you know this now you know famous you know widely acknowledged uh you know near nervous breakdown uh on stage at a show in rome in i think 1989 mm -hmm. and every time i you know i just i'd explain to him, you know, why it was important to keep that in. And he'd say, okay, yeah, yeah, all right. Yeah. And he'd move on. Yeah. So uh, he he didn't change anything uh, meaningful at all. Hmm. Um, yeah. And, and as far as the situation, like, I was staying at a hotel in downtown uh, Seattle, and he just said, oh, okay, well, great, I'll stop by at midnight and uh, <laughs> start reading. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, he was completely nocturnal. I mean, you know, at, at least at home, uh, yeah. I don't, on the road is a different story. But when he was at home, you know, we'd stay up like, you know, well, you know, until sunup, I think. But he was crazy, you know, va vampiric, you know, hours he kept. So he stopped by at, at midnight and um, this, you know, my little modest hotel room. And he sit down at this little desk, as you sometimes have yeah. in little hotel rooms. <laughs> and... Um, sit in front of this pile of paper and just quietly read it. And he'd go through a lot of cigarettes and, um, and I was kicked back on the bed, um, you know, just playing uh, electronic solitaire or working on an article or something. Yeah. And, you know, he would just sit there and quietly read it. And sometimes he'd kind of go, Hmm, or, or you'd chuckle, you know, yeah. uh, or he'd moan, like, Oh, something, you know, he'd just make these little noises and, you know, at one point he he said, "Yeah, yeah, this reads real good," <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and it was dead quiet in there. You could hear every sound of the building, like elevator 
motors clicking in and air conditioning turning on, gurgling of plumbing and dead quiet. Mm. And he's just sitting there reading this book I read about him. And I could see that you, to answer your question. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, it was kind of weird, <laughs> but I was also really comfortable. Like I knew I was very confident about everything that was in the book. And so uh, I, I had no, you know, hesitancy or insecurity about, you know, him reading it. And, I, you know, he was, you know, kind of the ultimate audience, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah. If, you know, if I can be confident, you know, if I'm confident about him reading it, I'm confident about anyone reading it. Yeah. And so it passed that test. And yeah. I was I was very pleased about that. What's the actual quote he says? Uh, what he said to you after he was done? Uh, yeah, he yeah he he just kind of he turned the last page, got up, hugged me, <laughs> and he said, "That's the best rock book I've ever read." <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, you know, probably was you know I I'm. I could be cynical and say it was, you know, he thought that because it was about him, but yeah. I don't, he was, I don't think he was that vain, <laughs> yeah. but, and yeah. And then he kind of like turned around and walked out the door <laughs> and, um, and into the Seattle night. Yeah. Uh, yeah. so yeah, that, I don't know. That was his one sentence review basically. <laughs> uh, in my experience, and I'm sure yours, when you're interviewing, uh, bands, uh, particularly if you're interviewing uh, members separately, uh, they wind up saying things, to you that they've never said to each other. Um, mm. I know in the book you mentioned Dave Grohl's reaction to the book, and then you also allude to a kind of passive-aggressive uh, interaction the whole band had on, I believe it was MTV, during an interview where the book is referenced. Um, <laughs> um, I know I don't believe it's in the in the in the book uh, you've articulated this. Did you get a sense that Kurt? Uh, in particular, learned stuff from this book about himself, his band, his life, um, anything like that? Uh, I'm sure, you know, it, sh simply the experience of reading your life story in chronological order yeah. must put a lot of things into perspective. Yeah. And very, very few people have that uh, luxury. Yeah. Um, he, he didn't tell me, you know, if anything, uh, you know, fell together any anything fell together for him yeah. but i can only imagine that having it laid out like that you know sequentially yeah. and uh you know could only have put some puzzle pieces together for him and yeah uh partially if only because yes um uh chris and dave and perhaps some other people were telling me things that they had not told him directly yeah so he was probably learning a lot about uh, what his bandmates were thinking. Yeah. Which is, a, you know, time-honored, as you mentioned, like a time-honored uh, rock and roll uh, uh, custom. You know, a lot of, uh, I'm sure there's many instances of the Rolling Stones, uh, you know, particularly Mick and Keith communicating with each other through the press. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm sure that happens, you know, all the time. It seems like memoirs are a common forum for this, to move units and to make some make some noise you know keith richards book mm. uh life comes out and what is the hubbub well uh keith said mick jagger has a small penis you know this right. is the legacy right. of an entire rock band that he's in, in a very storied uh career in life and that's what people fixated on so at the mm. time i think you alluded earlier to um just vaguely to criticisms of this particular book, and I assume you mean the original, Come As You Are, The Story of Nirvana, because this one isn't out yet. Um, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Do you remember what the contemporary reception uh, for the book was? Like, uh, It sounds like some of it uh, uh, st has resonated with you and stayed with you a little bit. Um, anything negative or positive that sticks out? Oh, no, I was ref I was actually referring to things that people have said, uh, you know, many years later. Oh, OK. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, you know, frankly, I don't think there were many reviews. <laughs> I can't remember many reviews of the book at the time. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, That's yeah. fascinating given what a landmark book it is. I mean, to this day. Uh, well, that's you know, fascinating to me. Well, uh, a, a little, another little insight into uh, publishing is that uh, the original version, unlike this one, came out in paperback. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, as I understand it, it's very difficult to get a paperback-only book reviewed. 
Oh. Yeah. Oh. So huh. yeah, I think that was uh, that was a big part of it. Is it not taken seriously because it's not hardbound? I, 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 uh, as I understand it, yeah. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I know you don't know. <laughs> Just yeah. sorry. You, you must have had conversations with your 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 publishing folks about these weird. I find publishing to be very complicated, more so than music. It's uh, nothing is promoted, and it's very weird. I don't. We're also in a, I think, a heightened age of illiteracy or something. I don't know. <laughs> you tell people you're reading a book, and they're like, "You're reading a book, a real book," or like. I said, you know, the publishers will send me a, hey, can you can you interview the author? I'm like, sure. Can you send me the book? No. I'm like, what? What do you mean? And they're like, ah, it's too expensive. Can we send you a PDF? And I got one recently, Michael. It has watermarks all over it, and I can't read a, a word. It's ridiculous. I'm like, how can you get me? Why? What's wrong with you? Anyway, this is a weird tangent about the publishing industry. I yeah. love them. I want to help. I love books. Mm. But there's some, have you experienced like weirdness in the publishing industry uh, from your own uh, vantage point? Um, not so much, but, um, I, I, I was, I, I'm really curious about how there was this incredible, uh, apparently book sales just exploded during the, the height of the yeah. pandemic and have since cooled off radically. Yeah. Uh, so that, uh, I, you know, that's, that's something about publishing that I find uh, really curious, but yeah, it, it, it still is, it's a funny business. Like they'll, I, I, there's things I don't understand, like, you know, paying several million, you know, for a, a book by, um, you know, a very famous politician that they know actually won't sell. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. sometimes they, those things sell, but sometimes you read like, oh, the, you know, we, they paid $50 million for the Pope's book, you know, and it sold yeah. 20,000 copies. And it, I don't know, the economics of publishing is something that well, uh, yeah. baffles me. Yeah, my wife's in the publishing industry, so she knows the real figures. And I'm like, geez, like, so it's, you know, I thought the music business was suffering. But anyway, this is not our domain. It's just, and, and, and not a way to upsell this book. Actually, maybe it is. <laughs> maybe we're, we'll softly guilt people. You should, I will wholeheartedly recommend this iteration of this book. It is really super fascinating. So let me get that out of the way. Subsequent, <laughs> subsequent to that, uh, you know, Kurt Cobain putting that final page down, giving you a hug. Uh, and, and paying you a, a high compliment, however facetiously or whatever <laughs> it might yeah. have been. Um, did you ever, because you, you did subsequently maintain uh, communications, did he ever bring up the book again? Did you two ever talk about the book after that time? Um, no. <laughs> that's that's a, uh, I, I've never thought about that before. No, no. I don't think we ever talked about it. I Like, I... I think that's partially why I included a couple of those interviews uh, I later found uh, that you mentioned where they talk about the book. Yeah. I think one uh, in, in one uh, Kurt, you know, <laughs> Kurt uh, kind of regrets being so candid. Uh, I, I actually didn't know that. Um, and that was a, kind of a shocker. Uh, and then in another interview, he says, um, you know, he said that uh, that I, you know, I asked them to write the book and yeah. And uh, and when when he was reading the book, I was hovering over his shoulder and stuff like yeah, you know yeah, and you know it, you could like and then other times he he claimed he's never read it, but the but as I point out in the, in one of the annotations, he was saying that to underscore this idea that uh, it, it wasn't an authorized book that you know that that it was a um, a real <laughs> a real biography uh, and not just some sort of thing that was done in cahoots with the band, yeah. He was trying to make it really adversarial, you know, seem adversarial so that, you know, people would get the idea. Yeah, so you viewed uh, it as strategic know. in the end, not sim – like, as I think as a – on a, again, in your s sort of strange status as both biographer and um, f friend – sorry, is that the wrong term to use for your relationship? Well, I, I, I would separate them because, as I say, like, I, I was his biographer while I was writing the book. The friendship really started – Afterwards, yes. No, I appreciate once the that. book was started, yeah. that's when he would call me. You know, late at night, or I, I I would travel with them on tour for a couple of stretches. You know, things like that. That's when that really happened. It, it wasn't. It, it, I, certainly, I got to know him quite well uh, during the writing of the book, but I, I can't say there was a, a friendship there. Okay, so when you encounter him uh, again, you 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 frame his strange. I think 
strange way of communicating whether or not he ever engaged, how he engaged with the book, whether in process Mm -hmm. after it came out. You subsequently view these strange and and sort of um, contradictory statements that he makes in the press as strategic to to furthering the mythology around the book, maybe to bump up book sales. But as a friend, when you caught wind of those things, were you like, "What are you? What's he doing? Why is he doing this to me?" Because he's vaguely, vaguely, well, he's certainly misrepresenting what happened. Were you hurt at all? Uh, well, uh, I only found out about that in the course of researching this book. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, and and in one of the annotations, I uh, I do say like uh, at first I was, you know, kind of hurt by that, but then I I realized he was just he was just trying to you know stake up for the authenticity of the book. Yeah, I I view. Okay, I don't want to oversell this. I have um, I'm someone who uh, when I deeply admire certain artists. Um, I think they're, they become part of my sort of, uh, they have become part of my framework, my building blocks, Mm. uh, my ethos maybe even. And Mm -hmm. if I think about my relationship with um, perception and how I want to be perceived or how I present myself, uh, two figures come to mind, uh, my mother and uh, Kurt Cobain. Uh, because uh, <laughs> my mother and my father, I think to a lesser extent, he he's he's just quieter than her. Was always very worried about how we came across in the community. Uh, so things like status, your house had to be a certain size, your car had to be sort of new, you had to dress, get a haircut, these sorts of things. Not unusual, maybe for a parent, but I, I rebelled against that um, in my teens. I think. Kurt also had a similar view of in terms of caring or not caring about what other people thought about him. But I, I've come to terms with the fact in my mid forties that maybe some of the indifference is a front um, that maybe I do care what people think. Uh, and I want to be thought of as in, in a certain way, Kurt seemed to have that in spades uh, to seem indifferent was cool, but he actually cared deeply. He wanted to be part of the right crowds. Is that a fair assessment? Yes. And it's, uh, yeah, I guess there are two parts uh, to my answer to that. One, I think is, um, you know, his mom uh, was very conscious of appearances. Ah. And she she kept, a you know, even though it was a very modest home, you know, she kept it neat as a pin. She herself, you know, very careful about her personal appearance. She, as Kurt mentions, you know, uh, she made sure her kids are well dressed and had nice haircuts and were well bathed and all that stuff. And it was, uh, he says something in the original Come As You Are about how his upbringing was something like working class posing as upper middle class or something like that. Right. And so this is armchair psychology, obviously, but it sure seems like he was rebelling against that. Mm-hmm. We know with his torn jeans and greasy hair and all that stuff, the the, the grunge look, you know, that sure. that fit perfectly with rebelling against your parents. And he, Kurt certainly had a, you know, pretty conflicted relationship to his parents. Yeah. But also, and this is one of the running themes of the annotations and the amplified come as you are. And there, uh, we can talk about that. There's different motifs and that keep, keep popping up in the book and I keep mentioning them in the annotations. But Shame, one of them, shame in particular uh, is one, and obviously, um, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but shame is one that I don't know that resonates with me too, as the child of immigrants in in Canada, and mm-hmm. not wanting to be embarrassed about that, and, and mm-hmm. wanting to sort of fit in, but also rebel. I'm sorry, I'm not suggesting, uh, Michael, that I'm the Kurt Cobain of podcasting, but <laughs> I think yeah. I think we. I have this weird thing where I'm like, I bet this is going to sound insane. There's part of me that feels like Kurt and I would have gotten along <laughs> if we were in the same milieu. We have some similarities. And I and now I'm starting to be like, did I uh, incorporate his personality traits in me? But then you say his mother was also image conscious, which I just said. So I feel like there's a bunch of us who re- like he resonated with us because we saw ourselves in him, not uh, all of it, obviously, and hopefully, but the good parts and the the strength and the 
confidence that he seemed to convey out of insecurity, I guess. Um, sorry to cut you off there, but I just want to say, like, I he's just a meaningful figure to me, and and I and and in the flaws that you present, and in the in the virtues you present. I see a little bit of myself in there, in there as well, if that makes any sense. Again, I don't mean to sound egomaniacal about it, but he's just an important figure to me. Sorry again to cut you off, but does that... No, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, let me uh, re- <laughs> respond to that, and then I'll finish <laughs> okay, uh, sorry. my other answer. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but uh, um, in, I, like, I, I, you know, in the introduction to the Amplified Comes You Are, I talk about when I first met Kurt, which was when I did a Rolling Stone a cover story on Nirvana that came out in April of 1992. Mm-hmm. And I was really nervous to meet him. Um, you know, he's a big rock star, smashed the guitars, might be a junkie. I'd never met a junkie before. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was doing a Rolling Stone cover story. I traveled all the way to Los Angeles to do it and all this stuff. And, you know, I was young and I was, you know, nervous. Yeah. And um, I, uh, I went to Kurt and Courtney's apartment. Courtney Love opens the door, offers me a plate of grapes very graciously. I check out their their living room, which is like scattered with dolls and record covers and stuff. And uh, she walks me down this tiny hall, this short hall that uh, in their apartment that seemed to go on forever because I was so nervous. But And uh, there's a door at the end of it, and I open the door, and there's Kurt Cobain lying in bed with his... Uh, back against the wall under an open window. Mm -hmm. And he says, oh, hi. And in that second, in that like moment, I thought, oh, I know this guy. Yeah. I I instantly got him. Yeah. And, and the more we talked, the, 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 the more I got him, he was, he was just like so many people I'd known and frankly, a little bit like me. But I gradually realized that that's a, a million, literally millions of people would have gotten the same sensation if they'd met him. And you're a great example of that. Yeah. Um, you know, you you come from, a, you know, a d- quite different background from him. And yet you still related to him in a completely valid way. Yeah. And like and he his genius was being able to convey that in music. Yeah. And so, uh, no, it's it's not egomaniacal or presumptuous or anything. It's just acknowledging his talent and, and your humanity. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the second, but to answer, to get back to the original question, yeah. um, the, the second thing about like Kurt and appearances is that he was a really, you know, he's a really bright, curious, artistic person. And Aberdeen, you know, is a, can be a beautiful place, but it's also, at least at the time, you know, in the mid late eighties was a very provincial place. Yeah. And Kurt wanted to leave Aberdeen, not just physically, but, you know, psychologically, emotionally, intellectually. And so, uh, he started to do that by talking, you know, meeting kind of more worldly people like, uh, Krist Novoselic, Mm -hmm. who was, you know, bilingual, had traveled in Europe, knew a lot about history and things. And Buzz Osborne, who knew about tons of different things and super smart and yeah. uh, introduced Kurt to punk rock. So that was one step. And then Kurt moves to Olympia and finds all these these affluent, you know, middle to upper middle class uh, college kids at the Evergreen State University. And he gets a little bit more cultured and he really wants to be around these people because they enrich him. And they're taking him out of this, you know, Aberdeen of the mind that he was trying to escape to the very end. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, if you want to talk about appearances, you know, he was trying to shed the appearance of being from Aberdeen. Well, and I, and I wish he had, I wish he had aged for so many reasons, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's something else that really resonates with me is, and it's something I hope I've, I'm maturing out of, and I have. Mat- I'm sorry. It's something I would say I have matured out of, which is trying to blame others for your problems. Always looking for an antagonist when there maybe isn't one. You know, maybe mm-hmm. being more aware that you are part of a problem. It's not just mm-hmm. your drummer. It's not just Aberdeen. For me, it wasn't just mm-hmm. Cambridge, Ontario. It wasn't that I mm-hmm. got to a college town and felt um, like there were more. 
I don't know, frontiers, more opportunities to do things. I mean, there's truth to that, but it saddens me that he didn't get to that phase of his life that I have gotten to, where, where you 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 kind of overcome that stuff and you realize, like, you got to really actually mellow out and you can't blame... You can't, what is it from The Sopranos? You can't walk around in pity for yourself? <laughs> you can't. Uh-huh. And I, I know that's maybe a bit glib given everything he went through, but I, I, sorry, just feeling that we are similar people. And, and I appreciate you saying it's not egomaniacal. He is obviously a once in a generation talent and I am not, but I feeling like we're similar people. I really think, I really think he could have come out of that mindset if he had had the, given himself the chance to, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, uh, as I as I mentioned in the, um, uh, you know, the annotations, um, you know, the, the comparisons to John Lennon are, yeah. uh, you know, all too numerous. But I, I felt the same way about John Lennon. He was just he was just try, starting to really figure life out. Yeah. You know, I think he was starting to mellow and figure stuff out uh, after being, you know, having this, you know, uh, absolute, you know, literally phenomenal, uh, you yeah. know, experience of being a beetle yeah. and how that, uh, you know, just would throw any human being for a, a wild psychological loop. And I, you know, just as he, just before he was murdered, he seemed to be starting to figure it out. And it's, it's just a, such a shame that he never got to see that, um, yeah. experience that. But it's also, it's a real shame that the rest of us who followed his art and Kurt's art, you know, never got to, you know, learn from their experience. It's a, you know, it's a damn shame. It's a, there's a, I know that we started this off I and I read this long passage about some of your motivations for, um, for writing an annotated version of this book. Regret is just part of the story. And, um, for those of us who have lost people to, to suicide, it's just something that never leaves us like this feeling that we could have helped or done something but then every once in a while you if you're fortunate i think because it's quite a burden to bear i think if you're fortunate you realize maybe there wasn't much else you could have done um that maybe it was the inevitable and as i read what you write and what his closest friends and family members have to say his um his death was inevitable uh, on some level. Um, that's your take on it? Yes. I, I'm afraid, you know, that's, uh, the case unless, I don't know. I mean, it's hard to say in retrospect, maybe, you know, someone or something could have come along and, uh, you know, diverted him, but, yeah. um, you know, he, apparently he had tried to kill himself twice yeah. you know before he's finally succeeded so when someone is that determined yeah it's hard hard to stop you i, I really don't know yeah we don't know and, and i say uh regret this is a weird yeah what could have hindsight is weird also because it's like what could have been what what there's so many things that could have maybe been done differently if mark lanigan had answered his phone you know like just weird things that you have to live with as a person like um uh, it's very difficult Earlier you invoked armchair psychology and I was joking about how, you know, sometimes as a journalist you do end up being sort of a therapist for for artists. But some revelations in this book for me were kind of clinical designations about Kurt that I Mm. don't recall coming across before. Obviously, those of us who know the story would pick up on the depression um, Mm. and the addiction. Uh, but I believe one of his relatives mentions that he was clinically diagnosed with ADD and uh, bipolarity. Is that right? Uh, yeah, yeah, and that's um, oh, gosh, I can't remember. It's like it, it's a relative of his. It's who an aunt, has, an, you know, an aunt who's a nurse or something, maybe. Yeah, yeah, she's got. I can't remember the exact uh, yeah. accreditation, but she's you know a credible source, and she's been quoted you know in publications yeah. as saying this. Um, and I think she wrote a book about um, yes. teenage depression and yes. suicide. So, uh, you know, I, I took that as a, a credible uh, source. Is that news? Am I just, is that just something I compartmentalized or forgotten? Like, to me, that's a bit of a revelation that such a, mm. 
Oh, here it is. Uh, Don's cousin Bev Cobain. Kurt's yeah. first cousin once removed for those keeping score. Very funny. By the way, Michael, the, the book is funny. <laughs> the annotations are funny because you kind of you sometimes will go in and be like, "What the hell was I thinking when I said that?" Which is funny. Like you, <laughs> I can't believe. Anyway, sorry. Uh, is a re- uh, yes. Don's cousin Bev Cobain is a registered nurse with a certification in mental health and the author of "When Nothing Matters Anymore: A Survival Guide for Depressed Teens." She didn't know. C- Kurt, but she's on record as saying Kurt was diagnosed at a young age with attention deficit disorder and then later with bipolar disorder. Um, the ADD makes sense because of the mythology. I didn't even know what Ritalin was until I encountered Nirvana. Um, mm-hmm. And you'd read about how it was prescribed to him uh, when he was a hyperactive kid. The bipolar thing I hadn't heard. I'd heard he... We were more familiar with the notion of manic depression, um, I think in my lifetime, bipolarity is something that's a, a new, a, still a relative. Sorry, it's just not a term I encountered very much as, as a kid in the nineties. Um, is that yeah. new information to you? Like, had you ever encountered bipolarity being associated with Kurt Cobain? No, I had not. But uh, you know, uh, again, I was not. Uh, you know, that that wasn't an original finding on my part. I was no, just no, yeah, found a reference to it in in another uh, piece of journalism. Uh, but no, I didn't uh, know that. Um, you know, Kurt uh, talked about you know manic depression and all kinds of different you know uh, mental and physical maladies <laughs> constantly, and you know he he claimed um, you know he was narcoleptic at one point. You know he's, he had all these things he claim he he suffered from. Um, For someone who treated their body, I would say pretty poorly for most of his life. I'm talking diet, nutrition. Obviously, yeah. the drugs. He was also mm. oddly a hypochondriac. Is that right? <laughs> I, 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 I couldn't say if he was being a hypochondriac, but he looking he for problems, was, looking for yeah. like I got this, I got that. This my, I mean, sorry, the story, yeah. but thing about his stomach that, condition, you know, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, that um, you know, maybe like like I say that I found going through the book that was one of the most interesting things about the process of it was finding these motifs, yeah. these things that kept popping up, like shame, yeah. um, the, you know, uh, collage. There's all kinds of collage in Kurt's work yeah. that I, I just didn't notice before. And all of a sudden, oh, yeah, there it is. He's collaging visuals and physical objects and chords and, uh, and words. Yeah. That was a big part of his work. And uh, another one, uh, another motif was, yeah, I, th- I think we talked about this earlier, was antagonists. Yeah. And one of his antagonists, besides like Aberdeen, his parents, um, different drummers, you know, various journalists, uh, was his own body. Yeah. And, you know, I, 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 he really did have scoliosis. And a lot of people doubted that he had this mysterious uh, stomach issue. But I, I'm convinced it was a real. Um, Chris Novoselic verified it. Um, if you read about said, if you read about the tour with Tad, mm-hmm. the, the where he had the nervous breakdown, yeah, quite clearly something was wrong with him and the uh, Tad there. <laughs> yeah. They were yeah. uh, sorry, gr- sorry everyone. It's a bit gross, but they basically had vomit offs, if you will. <laughs> and uh, sorry, sorry. Spoiler alert: There's a lot of vomit. <laughs> Uh, in the yeah. book on some level. Sorry to cut you off there, Michael. But yeah, I, th- no. I, I believe the stomach thing. Uh, I'll just say that. Yeah. 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 So. And I, uh, <laughs> I, I left this out of the book, but I think he had what, uh, what uh, apparently Mike Mills had and got surgery for, which was called Meckel's diverticulum. Yeah. And I, I didn't put that in the book because I'm not a doctor and I couldn't get anyone to, you know, uh, posthumously diagnose uh, yeah. someone. But I, I, it seems like everything he, the way he described it fits it perfectly. Yeah. And uh, I, I guess I could have called Mike Mills and asked him for his take. <laughs> sure. <laughs> but yeah, but that's about, you know, so I didn't hazard my own uh, amateur diagnosis, but yeah. Yeah, I think it was for real. Yeah. And um, the, the, the fact is, though, that, um, you know, doing heroin was perhaps not the best way to uh, ameliorate the symptoms. He was a very complicated person. But he was very meaningful to me, and uh, I will say it has been 
really actually exciting to um, go through the uh, discography as your book has prompted me to do. It's just not mm-hmm. music I have had the time to... Sp- I just haven't had that much time to... My my son, um, again, um, I'm not sure what's going on on the internet sometimes. I try to pay attention to what he's... what what they're up to and stuff, but it's hard (laughs) because you want to give them some freedom to discover things. He just seems to know a lot about Nirvana, and I find that really touching. He was excited when he saw your book in the kitchen when it arrived. He's like, oh, awesome. What This is great. And it's just a real testament to the... You know, obviously one of the biggest bands in the world ever. And it's such an unlikely story that you've been lucky to tell at least twice now. <laughs> I mean, there was already yeah. a, a revised edition of, of Come As You Are, as I recall, after Kurt died. and uh, uh, No, I, I added uh, a chapter after he died. You added a chapter, sorry. It just yeah. Seemed, yeah. It, yeah, yeah, it just seemed like the right thing to do <laughs> to acknowledge this momentous <laughs> thing that had happened. Yeah, so I, I just want to compliment and commend you and thank you for for your contribution to telling this band story um i know you say i think you say i don't mean to i'll paraphrase but i believe you say in the book that uh after kurt passed away you didn't really engage in any literature about nirvana by others um the music was hard to listen to until someone recently is am i capturing that yeah yeah, yeah. and you know that was that was a revelation when i just finally listen, really listen to Nirvana again. I was out at a bar with some friends and the music was really loud and suddenly they put on a bunch of Nirvana songs. And, you know, usually I just, you know, not to be melodramatic or anything, but I would, I would step outside usually if that happened. And, uh, but I stayed and I realized (laughs) that, um, that Nirvana rocks their, their music legitimately rocks. It's not like it's, it's this myth, you know, this, uh, myth that's been built up in our minds. Like yeah. there, there was a, a basis for it. They were a great band, yeah. and and that the music, you know, uh, there is certainly pain encoded in it, but the music was specifically, I, I think, specifically consciously written to overcome pain. Yes, yes, of all kinds. Yeah. And um, you know, par- and that's partially like kind of hence the name of the band, uh, whether he realized it at the time or not. But that's that's what it was all about. Yeah. You know, Kurt, Kurt was trying to medicate himself in all kinds of ways, not just with heroin. But, you know, at one point I mentioned, you know, Courtney said that he tried it, you know, he used sex for that too. It was holy for him, she said. And, and music was also a great painkiller. And at the end of many shows, he would prove that yeah. by hurling his body into the drums, yeah. you know, and and just getting up and and walking off, yeah. uh, uh, seemingly unscathed. And it was because it's sort of like, you know, those, those people who, you know, get into a state and walk across, you know, hot coals or something like that. It was to show that the music, you know, sort of proof of concept that um, the music had made him impervious to pain. Yeah. And I think maybe he hoped that that had had the same effect on the audience. Not to uh, put too fine a point on this or suggest some sort of um, dark side of the moon, Wizard of Oz situation. Yeah. But I will encourage people that as you're reading the Amplified Come As You Are, the story of Nirvana, when the band in the action of the book, uh, when Kristen and, and Kurt begin actually jamming and and some of the sounds are captured. What I discovered uh, over the weekend, Michael, is that if you start to play with the lights out, the uh, sort of uh, compilation of mm. uh, outtakes and, and early recordings, it syncs up rather beautifully. I, I, I would be reading, uh, I don't know if you have any particular feelings about that collection. Uh, I hadn't revisited it in some time. It was actually quite remarkable. I, I, I was finding myself reading about some of those recordings as they were playing on the speaker. So I don't know if you have playlist suggestions other than that or, or, or if you think that's uh, untoward. I actually had someone tell me they never uh, listen to music as they're reading uh, books because it's too distracting. Michael, would you discourage people from listening to Nirvana as they read this book? Uh, well, uh, you know, <laughs> th- th- you, you, you hit on something. Um, you know, we did extensive uh, uh, scientific focus group uh, work uh, <laughs> 
you know, reading, uh, figuring out reading, average reading speeds and <laughs> things like that, and syncing it too with the lights out. So I'm glad that you picked that up. <laughs> okay, good. I yeah. made that up on my own, but uh, apparently there was some real focus group work done. I didn't realize that. That's oh, oh, that was that was uh, months of intensive research <laughs> put into that. Um, yeah, no, that's really interesting. Uh, you know, I, I guess everybody, you know. <laughs> I prefer reading and writing in mostly in silence yes. myself. Generally, I do um, too. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I just retain more. Um, yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, but I mean, uh, whatever, whatever floats your boat. <laughs> just a little. Uh, I just wanted to give people a little life hack that I think it actually <laughs> somehow I didn't plan for it. It just ended up happening. Um, oh, you know. Oh, but speaking of playlists, I did actually did a. a I, I'm not sure when it goes up. It comes up soon, but I did a playlist for Tidal, yeah. the streaming service, and it's songs by every artist mentioned in the amplified "Come as You Are" and the original "Come as oh, You Are." Cool, but but not Nirvana. Like all the non-Nirvana bands who were mentioned in the in the amplified "Come as You Are," and it's something like <laughs> it's something like 350 songs. Oh wow! Uh, so you know, if you have a you know whatever eight hours to spend or something like that, uh, you can find uh, that playlist on Title soon. I actually wrote a um, an essay for Title uh, that is, uh, goes up with that uh, playlist about um, Nirvana's classic rock roots. Yeah, yeah. That see that kind of thing would be pretty interesting. Uh, maybe you read about some uh, something in the book, a band that maybe you don't know about. And uh, you whistle up uh, my playlist or just do some investigation of your own and, and listen. I don't know, like maybe, I don't know, maybe there's some, someone out there who's never really heard Kiss, <laughs> you know, who comes up quite a bit in the book. Uh, you know, check it out. Listen to the Kiss and maybe, think, you know, see the connection between their like chunky, catchy rock music with, some, you know, with a guy yelling <laughs> to, to Nirvana's catchy, chunky rock music with a guy yelling. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I think uh, it is one of the great things that I took from growing up as Nirvana were around is the sense of spreading the word about other bands. I know we don't need to spread the word about Kiss and Led Zeppelin and and, and Aerosmith necessarily, but <laughs> but at the same time, you do. I mean, at this point, you do. We're so fractured that I think pointing people down a, I don't know, an REM wormhole is not necessarily the worst thing in the world you can do. And I think that's in the spirit of Kurt wearing, you know, I remember seeing him on some interview wearing a Sebado shirt or a Daniel Johnson shirt. And that prompted me, I mean, a little bit embarrassingly, it wouldn't prompt me to get the same shirts, but it also, I think, <laughs> prompted me at the time to dig into their music. That was a real, and I know he might've been overcompensating because he felt this sense of guilt that his band had took, taken off and he, and he felt some that he owed the underground something, I think. But mm. it, I also think it had, and it was impactful. Um, but yeah, and you're right about Kiss, you know, and Led Zeppelin. You know, they certainly don't need any further promotion. But it, but the point of you know, in the spirit of the book, listening to them in light of Nirvana, I, I feel is pretty enlightening. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so you know, that's in the spirit of the, the Amplified Come as You Are, which is pointing out. Uh, context and and the fact is that Kiss and Led Zeppelin and Queen and bands like that and the Beatles, you know, really big bands are an important uh, part of the uh, the Nirvana backstory. As are you know plenty of more obscure artists like Daniel Johnston or or Jandek or Calamity Jane, Bikini Kill, who are also in that yeah. playlist. Yeah. And you know it's 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 a you know it's it's a life's rich tapestry <laughs> uh, uh, put to music. So we've gotten to the point where you were able to listen to Nirvana again, and mm. um, in this project, I'm sure you just a flood of memories and, and experiences. Um, I know things didn't end well for you. Well, sorry, that's a horrible way of putting it. You were given the impression that. There was some disconnect with Kurt by the end of his life because you had done some interviews after um, he'd OD'd in, in Rome, and I know mm. you—that's—that's that's a psychic scar you're, you're bearing. Did finishing this project, I get the sense it gave you some closure. Um, it gave you a sense like that you could listen to the band again. Is that accurate? Do you feel some closure? Does this reconcile some feelings you've been, you know, pondering for all this time? 
Yes, uh, but you know, to be uh, clear, like I, I could listen to the uh, band again, um, you know, and that was, uh, you know, maybe ten years ago or so. Oh, okay. Um, you know, when I had that that experience um, or more, but yeah, I mean, doing this, uh, writing the amplified "Come as You Are," um, you know, was uh, an attempt at uh, at closure. You know, um, trying to figure out, you know, why these things happened. Yeah. And connecting dots that were right there in the book, and so um, I, I, I try and you know, especially with the annotations, I, I'm just reacting to things that were right there in the book, yeah. hiding in plain sight, and um, and you know, making sense of what happened, not not just with Kurt's death, but with the whole Nirvana phenomenon, yeah. in general, which you know certainly changed uh, my life, but changed many people's lives, yeah. and so. I wasn't just doing this for myself. I was hoping to write a book that would help other people make sense of what happened yeah. with Nirvana and what happened with Kurt and maybe, you know, help people uh, a little bit with people who have known people who have uh, committed suicide. Yeah. It, it, like I said, it's a remarkable feat and I think you've done and accomplished a lot of the things you you maybe set out to do. I uh, would be remiss if I didn't mention one of the most fun revelations in this book, and I don't want to spoil anything. Feel free to talk about this as much as you want right now, Michael. You jammed with Nirvana. I had never heard this story before. Is this is this a revelation? Have you have you talked about this before? Oh, well, I'll tell you that in a second. You know, actually, that's so funny. <laughs> I thought you were going to say something else. I uh, I I. I'm very proud of decoding the artwork on the back of In Utero. Oh, right. And, like, I think that's like, I just, I'm just so proud of that. I'm, I'm you know, if I'm, uh, I'm going to be smug about something in that book, that's it. <laughs> okay. I think, I think I could uncover something pretty cool. Um, it does seem but, like uh, the collage stuff was a revelation for you, realizing how he, how much he collaged and what it might mean. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. That was, that was part of it too. Yeah. But, uh, but in terms of sort of sleuthing something out, you know, that, <laughs> uh, I don't no, think it's... anyone's ever come close to that. Um, <laughs> Congratulations. Yeah, it's, yeah, no, it's, a, yeah, yeah. that's, that's good work. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah I just, I, I just, uh, I'm not a, try not to brag about things, but <laughs> I am, I'm pretty damn smug about that. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, jamming with Nirvana, you know, like after the book was done, I would go out to Seattle and visit all kinds of friends who I'd made in the course of writing the book and doing previous articles on Seattle bands. And um, at one point I called up Kurt and he said, oh, you know, uh, we're going to rehearse tonight. Why don't you come along? <laughs> and he said, it's 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 going to be boring, but if you want to go, you know come on along yeah and i I just like you know come on dude it's not gonna be boring (laughs) and so i tagged along and they were at some you know some warehouse and you know the industrial part of seattle i remember uh we got off i think we got off an elevator and walked down this long concrete hallway and on one side for like i don't know like 50 feet was just a a line of uh cremation urns along the Mm along the uh hallway and i guess th- there was a place that that f- created them uh across the hall from where nirvana rehearsed and we walk into this you know room and it was totally you know it was, wasn't like treated for sound or anything like that it wasn't a fancy pa or incredible equipment there's no sound person or techs hanging out or nothing like that it was just a practice room and kurt chris pat and dave and they just started playing just like every other band and every other practice space all over the world. Yeah. And, um, yeah. And then after, you know, they ran through their set and I think the boring part was, um, was Kurt would stop the song sometimes. And if something was not quite right, he'd correct someone. Sure. But the thing is like, his changes were really subtle. And yet when they were incorporated, all of a sudden you could understand why he said that. Oh, oh, mm. just, like, it just fell into place. It was, he was uncanny about that. Yeah. And he was very particular. He had a great ear. Like, even though this is this kind of shambling, loud, you know, distorted music, he had these fine points that took it, you know, as they say in the music business, to the next level. But then at the end, you know, they were done and they just started goofing around. And, um, I don't know, uh, Chris picked up and put down his bass and picked up an accordion. <laughs> and Dave, you know, could play other instruments. So he, like, jumped on the bass and the drum set was all empty. And, I'd been playing drums since I was seven. And so they were just kind of noodling, noodling around for a second. And I said, I just waved at Dave and I pointed at the drums. 
And he goes, yeah, yeah, go, go. And uh, I sat down on the drums and uh, Chris started playing um, Cashmere <laughs> by Led Zeppelin. <laughs> and we were jamming on that. And that kind of morphed into something else. But and it was, I mean, I'm not making, I hope I'm not making too big of a deal about this. It was probably like seven or eight minutes, 10 minutes at tops. And, uh, you know, I can't say I gained any serious insight into the inner workings of Nirvana <laughs> as a rock band. But, it, you know, that it's true. I did, I did jam with Nirvana. <laughs> and and Kurt and Pat were also playing. Yep. Come on, man! Like I, it's not the insight. That's just a neat experience. And I never. Sorry if I'm if I've missed this story, but mm -hmm. I thought that was pretty fun and fascinating. And yeah, yeah that that's the kind of thing that I would only tell close friends. Um, sure. Yeah. Up until recently, and then I just you know when I was doing this, I I just said, well, I'm just telling every other thing about Nirvana, my experience with Nirvana, I'll throw that in too, is maybe it'll shed some light on my relationship to the band. You know, again, so I, I put uh, it in. Yeah, no, it's great. And I, again, not to further connect uh, myself, Kurt Cobain and you, all of us were drummers. Like that's, we, we would have all been friends. If we were the same age and hung out, I think we would have hung out and uh, it would have been fun. You know what I'm saying? Right. Right, and we probably all would have listened to Nirvana. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that again. Look, that was his genius. The, he he connected. He he like a lot of people related to him for real. It was it was genuine. It wasn't some fake thing he was you know putting on to sell records. Yeah. That's really how he was, I and mean, he directly translated that into sound waves. Yeah, uh, remarkable. Can you see yourself revealing? Anything further about this band and your experiences with them in the ensuing years? Because by the end of the book, there are some allusions from Chris and Dave about the end of Kurt's life and how they've they just haven't talked about it with anyone. Um, I'm sure there are things you you've alluded to a couple of things you you didn't include in the book, but is there anything more from your point of view that you need to tell? Um, no, uh, I, I, I think I, I told everything I, I, you know, yeah. for lack of a better word, uh, need to tell. Yeah. Um, I'm sure, you know, other people much closer to Kurt will, might step forward, yeah. um, in, in the future and, and, um, tell some more stories and explain some more things. But, uh, yeah. I think, I think I pretty much hit my limit as to, you know, what, what I, you know, you, you you write about what you know, so that's what I did. Yeah. And uh, yeah. anything beyond that, um, I didn't write about. Okay, Michael, I appreciate this time. Where can people go? Well, no, there's two things actually. Um, I'll start with the sort of planning. Um, I'm curious about what's next for you. This is a big project you've undertaken. It sounds like it was a pandemic era project. Are you working on anything else? You know, we're all some of us view your books as really monumental. Our band could be your life. This book, I've already told you, Rock Critic Law changed my life. Are you got, <laughs> you got something else coming up? Uh, or are you working on anything that we need to know about? Um, well, uh, actually, right now, I'm just finishing up an essay about Sonic Youth, oh. kind of springboarding off of um, Thurston Moore's upcoming memoir, Sonic Life. Mm -hmm. And that will be published by the Yale Review. Oh. And then... Um, then I'm going to Disneyland. <laughs> I'm really fried from this whole experience, you know. Uh, um, I, I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna really. I'm gonna rest and you know, go on hikes and stuff. Uh, uh, read books I don't need to read and things like that. Uh, and then um, make my next move. But I do have an idea for a book, and well, uh, our band could be your life was kind of a a prequel to. Oh. Come hmm. as you are, right? And I'm kind of thinking about a sort of prequel to our band could be your life. Oh, okay. I'm not going to fish any further because I'm yeah. sure. Oh, it's, you it's, you couldn't because uh, I, I'm not exactly sure what form that's going to take. <laughs> well, I I can say I mean that's just, that's very exciting uh, to hear. So even if it's uh, a glimmer in your eye, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. If I, if I may say. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, but it, like uh, for, once I finish this Yale review thing, I'm uh, I'm gonna take some 
in all modesty, well-deserved time off. <laughs> you know, I think everyone of us who engages in uh, the 90s for prolonged periods needs a break from it sometimes. Uh, it was formative <laughs> time for me. You're, I think you've got some years on me, but it was a very formative time for me. Oddly enough, <laughs> last week I get two books in the mail from different publishers. Uh, the Amplified Come As You Are, The Story of Nirvana, and Thurston Moore's book, uh, mm. Sonic Life. So I'm going to dig into that. I'm not taking a 90s break, apparently. I'm going to dig right into that after this. And uh, well, well, actually, the be one of the best parts of uh, Thurston's book is um, uh, people call him Thurston. It's sort of like people call people Madonna or Cher or something like that. Yeah. Um, one of the best parts of his book actually is the whole section on the 80s. Oh. In the 80s, like downtown mm. – you know, the lower Manhattan art scene, some great stuff in there. Yeah. And and then, yeah, I mean, the 90s, obviously, uh, really important. Uh, but the, the the formative 80s stuff, I, I don't know, the, the the foundation myths of bands, I think, are personally, I find the most interesting. And he, there's tons of really interesting stuff there. Oddly enough, Nirvana are kind of an 80s band. I mean, they broke in 91. Like, that's, you know, still, I know, sorry, technically this isn't true, but they are a product of the 80s. Um and what was going on. Uh, they came of age at that point. Uh, obviously, Thurston, uh, older than them. But um, the 80s is worth, yeah, the 80s is worth a deeper dive, maybe, in terms of that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. As you've well, done. I mean, you've done already, <laughs> I guess. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. the 90s were, you know, you could say a product of the 80s. And so, yeah. uh, you know, in the same way, uh, Nirvana was a, a product of the 80s. But they certainly, you know, as I mentioned time and again in my book, um, you know, they were so, you know, an exemplary phenomenon of the 90s and tied into so many different uh, cultural and political, not to mention musical aspects of that time. Yeah. Well, I also want to say in, in all uh, humility and modesty, I came across my show in your book and I got so excited you referenced my show in this book about Nirvana. I felt like, sorry, this is going to sound, uh, I, I don't mean to sound insane. I was like, I have vaguely become canonized, you know? <laughs> Saint Vish. I don't know. I, I, I just feel like I, that just, sorry, I just want to say thank you. That is oh. meaningful to me that you referenced uh, my show. Oh, well, thank you for getting the goods. That was a really excellent uh, nugget. <laughs> Yes, and I actually, uh, you know, did you come across the the, the time in uh, 2013 where Steve Albini told me about his first encounter with Kurt? Oh, wow, no. So in 2013, I, um, I, you know, I'd interviewed Steve many times in the past, but never about Nirvana. I kind of purposely talked about his own. I didn't want to talk about Nirvana with him. I, I was sure he must have been inundated. But hmm. around the time of the 20th anniversary reissue of uh, In Utero, I asked him, can we just go all in? And he said, okay. So we did. Mm. And among the mm. stories he told uh, that he said he had never told anyone before was that Kurt attended the final Big Black show. And mm. um, Steve didn't realize it at the time, obviously, but Big Black destroyed all their equipment and uh, people were coming up to them asking or trying to get fragments of equipment or gathering whatever they destroyed. And one of the kids came up to him with a piece of, I think, his guitar and said, is it okay if I take this piece of your guitar? And as I recall, Steve said, of course you can. It's garbage. It's useless. You go nuts. He realizes after he realized after, as he was telling me the story, that that was Kurt. And that's the first mm -hmm. time they interacted was at that final Big Black show. And then, yeah, we went in uh, quite a bit, obviously, on the recording and process of In Utero. So it's funny. It's a small world. And we all have these um, interactions with people who, uh, you know, encountered Kurt. And um, anyway, sorry. I, I, I That just was a meaningful one for me. And he said he's never re related that story. to he At the time, he said he never related that story to anyone before. So... Yeah, but that, you know, oh, well, that's, that is a really cool story. Um, but that just goes to show what a small world that indie community was. It was very hermetic. Yeah. And it makes all the sense in the world, you know, that, that Kurt and Steve Albini would have, you know, intersected, you know, long before they actually worked together. It's just, there just weren't that many 
people in it. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's a bit different now, especially with the Internet. People can have connections without, you know, ever actually physically meeting. But back then, you know, that kind of thing happened. It was just a smaller world and people kind of just intersected uh, a lot more yeah. often. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and and all this to say, I feel part of that intersection by being mentioned in the book. So thanks again. Mm-hmm. I mean, I really, it just means a lot to me. So thank you. Um, okay. So for more information about the Amplified Come As You Are, the story of Nirvana, and uh, for those of us who want to keep track of your comings and goings, uh, Michael, where would you like to direct people on the internet uh, beyond bookstores and things like that? Well, uh, you can follow me on um, on the Twitter. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, I can't even say the new name. Uh, <laughs> none, none, of, none of us do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Don't worry. Um, yeah. But it's just uh, my name, M-I-C-H-A-E-L-A-Z-E-R-R-A-D, with a at symbol in front. Um, mm-hmm. And that's kind of like, that's the main uh, conduit for uh, news from me. And then okay. uh, uh, the book is published by Harper One Books, which is a division of HarperCollins. So you can find information about the book and how, how to buy it on their harpercollins.com uh, website. Okay. All right. And I'll link to the, all those things as well. This book is, uh, it was already essential. It's become more essential uh, in this new iteration. So again, um, Michael, thank you so much for all of the work you've done. Thank you so much for making time for me um, for interviews over the years. And, and I hope you enjoyed this one. And uh, I wish you the best of luck in the future. And I hope we speak again uh, when your new book is ready. Uh, thank you so much, Vishen. Thank you for the smart and kind words about the book. You know, you, you're, you're one of the first people uh, I've gotten any feedback from because <laughs> it, it's <laughs> no one's seen it yet. And uh, I'm really touched. Uh, you're, you're a bright guy and you know your stuff. So uh, it's very flattering. Thank you. And thanks for having me on your show again. It's always, you know, it's always a pleasure. It really is. I always feel very fortunate that I get to speak to uh, people I uh, greatly admire on this show. And of course, uh, as you could maybe tell, Michael is uh, right at one of the, he's like, he's got a top spot on my list of uh, uh, influences as a music writer, a music journalist. Um, so it's uh, just been lovely that I've been able to connect with him over the last years. That Oslo trip I mentioned, uh, I believe it took place in 2007. So we've had, and then had a couple of conversations subsequent to that. So anyway, Michael, if you're listening at this point of the show, thank you once again for being uh, back on the show to talk about uh, one of my favorite bands of all time, Nirvana. Uh, for everyone else, this is uh, episode 812 of Creative Control, which is part of the Entertainment One Podcast Network and is available just about wherever you get your podcasts. If you can't find an episode you're looking for, or if you want to learn more about me and sign up for my monthly newsletter, please visit vishkana.com. And also like Creative Control on uh, Facebook currently, uh, and follow the show on Twitter at Vish Creative, or you can follow me directly on Twitter and on Instagram at Vish Kana. I'm also on Blue Sky and Threads, and uh, the show has a YouTube channel um, that isn't uh, frequented too much, but some people listen to the uh, podcast on YouTube. So I just want to mention that in case you uh, find that uh, useful. Find me on all those things if you if you like. Also, please visit patreon.com slash creative control to make a flexible monthly donation to sustain this podcast. Six dollars American or more a month grants you access to exclusive content. You get episodes earlier than everybody else. And uh, there are some T-shirts that I provide to uh, Patreon supporters uh, and you can pick between one of the two designs. And if I still have uh, sizes in the design you like, I will send you one in the mail. Just message me on Patreon and I'll get you one while supplies last thank you so much for supporting the show on patreon i like doing the show i love doing the show but um it's not easy to do anything uh, these days of course and uh and make a living at it so uh we shall see what happens in life but i enjoy doing this so thanks for supporting creative control thanks as always to uh some lovely independent businesses back in ontario where i'm from originally pizza trocadero the bookshelf and planet bean coffee in uh, guelph and granddad's donuts in hamilton all of them provide in-kind support for this show. I want to thank uh, Jim Guthrie for lending me some music of his on the show. You can learn more about Jim at jimguthrie.org. And finally, thank you so much for listening to this episode with Michael Azarad. I highly encourage you to pick up a copy 
of the Amplified Come As You Are, the story of Nirvana. It is so fascinating. I hope uh, we can. I conveyed that enough in this episode and that you feel intrigued to, to read the book. It is really wonderful. So thank you, Michael, and thank you for listening. I hope you're well. Please subscribe to this show or follow it and whatnot, and I will talk to you very soon. Bye for now.